I'd like to um, hand it over to Professor Burnett, who's uh, from the Warburg Institute in, and is in London right now, where it's a little bit later than here, and is suffering through snow. Is that what I? Well, no, no, we we also are very cold. No, no snow, but um, um, cold and dry at the moment. Yes, yes. Um, okay, well, I'm very happy to be with you. Um, I'm sorry not to be with you in person. Um, as you see, uh, we, we decided that I would be talking about Arabic roots of Western mathematics and cosmology. Um, I don't want to disappoint you, but I won't be talking about um, the possible Arabic origins of Copernicus's uh, heliocentric system, uh, which is a very interesting but a rather controversial subject. Um, I will be looking at some rather, one might say, more fundamental um, influences of um, Arabic learning learning and Arabic customs and um, practices on the West. Um, and I will be taking you through the four arts of mathematics, what are in classical and early and, and medieval times it's called the quadriv quadrivium, that's arithmetic, um, geometry, music, and astronomy. Um, incidentally, mentioning some cosmology in respect to astronomy, um, but this is really based on um, what started as a classical tradition, a tradition actually discussed by Boethius in the early 6th century, uh, who invented the word quad quadrivium um, for the four mathematical sciences, um, which were contrasted to the three, um, you could say, sciences of um, of speech, um, um, they were called in Latin sermo quinales, um, which were the trivium, the trivium of logic, dialectic, and rhetoric, um, which together made the seven liberal arts, um, and the several liberal arts together um, constituted philosophy. Um, so what we're dealing with um, is um, a secular tradition, it's nothing to do with theology, religious, um, 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 revealed religion or anything, it's a secular division, um, of science, and it um, um, originated in the classical period. It was transmitted um, both to the West um, through translations from Greek into Latin, and in the and especially in the East um, through translations first of all into Syriac, and then from Syriac into Arabic, then directly from Greek into Arabic. Um, the highlight of this period of translation was the ninth century. Um, uh, where we have um, patronage of um, um, of the sciences, of the translations, a real effort by the caliphs of the day of the time, who, of the time who were based in Baghdad, um, to make uh, all knowledge available in Arabic, and Arabic became, as it were, the lingua franca for scientists throughout the Arabic realm. Um, and uh, that included Al-Andalus in Spain. I will start my I will start my um, screen, my my PowerPoint um, just now after this uh, brief introduction, um, and that will um, and during the PowerPoint I will be saying a little bit more about the actual um, process of transmission. Um, but please interrupt me at any time and say, "Well, I want to know more about this," or <laughs> or, "Or I want to know less about this," and get on with the next subject. So here's the sharing. I'm sharing the screen now. Um, and I think you can see um, <clears throat> the title, um, Arabic Roots of Western Mathematics and Cosmology. Um, and I use the word roots specifically because one of the elements are the roots that you find in algebra. Um, uh, algebra, of course, being an Arabic word. So it's an Arabic science that was transmitted to the West. And the little uh, <clears throat> cartouche, as it were, um, is a picture of um, from an Arabic manuscript of two signs for the root, which in fact are the letters, the Arabic letters, jim, um, because they are um, the first letters of the word jizr, which is the Arabic for root. And in one case, you have the root of half, one over two, and in another case, you have the root of one and a half. So root is, as it were, the leitmotif of this lecture. Um, and we will be hearing more about roots, but think of roots in terms of the Arabic origins of so much of Western science. Now, if we continue, um, do you recognize where that is? Um, this is, of course, Toledo. Um, Toledo 
um, was indeed the centre for translating of works from Arabic into Latin um, in the 12th and early 13th centuries. Um, Toledo um, was, um, until 1085, um, under Arabic control. The Arabs invaded Al-Andalus in 7, uh, 717, and they uh, quickly established themselves in most of the Iberian Peninsula. Um, but um, then, um, and, and they established um, different, well, there were different strengths in different parts. Um, and Toledo um, was, the Cordoba was for a long time the actual capital, but Toledo was a place uh, which excelled in the sciences and in astronomy. It was where astronomical tables were drawn up in the late 11th century, just before the conquest. Um, and Saragossa in the northeast of Spain was another very important Arabic uh, Islamic center for the sciences under the kings called the Banu Hud. Um, but Toledo, um, um, uh, with the the conquerors with Alfonso the first and sixth. Um, um, there were many scientists who were in, if not directly in contact with the Arabic Islamic sciences, who scientists who had been there before and drawn up the Toledan tables and so on. Um, at least inherited their books, but I think it's, it's nice to say see a, a continuation from Arabic scholarship into Latin scholarship taking place in Toledo soon after the conquest and reaching a high point in the early 12th century and going throughout the 12th century. And just to, um, well, as an indication of this, um, we have a whole lot of, um, well, the centre, let's say, of uh, the intellectual life in Toledo was the cathedral, um, and we have a whole lot of documents from the cathedral. And this is a, a charter um, from 1154, I believe. Um, the, the date is actually given in what we call the Spanish era, which is 38 years later. Um, and amongst the people who had signed this document, um, if you see on, you can just to say C on the right here, um, Ego G, um, um, uh, Dictus um, <clears throat> Bagister Confirmo. So I, G, who must be Gerahardus, um, who is called the master, the master, um, I confirm this document. Uh, and we know this is Gerahardus because the greatest of the translators from Arabic into Latin into Toledo was Gerhard of Cremona, an Italian who'd come to Toledo looking for a copy of the great um, uh, uh, work of Ptolemy, his Almagest. Um, and this was the high point, really, of astronomical learning. And it, eventually he translated the Almagest, but he translated many, many other works, especially works on mathematics and medicine. And he died in 1187. So this just proves that he was there and he was within the cathedral as a um, a cleric, um, a clerk, and presumably he got he was he was paid by the cathedral by the church um, to make these translations of secular works. I mean, he wasn't translating theology. Um, so Spain was uh, one centre for the translations. Um, the newly conquered areas, and later in 1136, 1148, we have Cordoba and Seville falling to the, uh, um, the Christians. Eventually, of course, in 1492, Granada was also conquered and there were no more uh, Islamic um, um, kingdoms or Islamic realm um, in Spain. But um, for a long time, we have Sp Spanish um, Christians or you know, Christian rulers living side by side as neighbors to, um, to uh, um, Islamic rulers and a lot of connections between them. And this explains to a large extent uh, why there are more translations made from Arabic into Latin in the Iberian Peninsula, I mean, we have to include Portugal here, um, than in any other part of the Mediterranean. Um, this, as I've already mentioned, um, another center for uh, for science was Saragossa in the northeast. Um, was well, sorry, Tarazona in the northeast of Spain, which was um, under Arabic rule until the early 12th century. Um, but more importantly, it was next to um, the great Arabic Islamic uh, scientific center of Saragossa on the River Ebro. 
Um, and we know that in the early 12th century, I think it was in 1109, the Almoravids, um, who were trying to capture, to reconquer um, areas of Spain, which had been lost to the Christians, drove out the um, um, the incumbent uh, Islamic uh, king, um, Banu Hud, belonging to the Banu Hud dynasty, who then found um, a, um, a stronghold in a neighboring um, well, fortress called uh, uh, Rueda de Jalon. Here's the remains of this fortress on a tributary to the river Ebro. Uh, Ebro. Um, and this was halfway, as it were, between Saragossa and Tarazona. No, I'll come back to that. Um, and uh, we know that the bishop of Tarazona, someone called Michael, um, sent um, a scholar who was working with him, he was one of his clerks, called Hugo Sanctaliensis, um, to this stronghold of Halon um, in order to take Arabic manuscripts. Um, if they had friendly relations, so he took hold of these Arabic manuscripts and proceed to translate the um, um, the contents of these manuscripts. Um, and just to give one example, this is uh, one of Hugo Sanctaliensis's translations. It's a translation of a cosmology. I won't be talking much about this cosmology because it's specifically a cosmology attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, an alternative, as it were, to the mainstream, which is that of Aristotle and, um, and Ptolemy for the astronomy side. Um, but it is curious that we have on the frontispiece, this is the frontispiece to this work, which was written probably within the lifetime of the translator, um, already um, or still in contact with Tarazona. Um, we have here a picture of the author, Apollonius. You can probably just see down here Apollonius. Uh, <clears throat> um, and he's described here as Magnus. But if you look at the text here, he's described, Apollonius is described as Margus, and Margus must be correct rather than Magnus. He's described as being a sage. Um, and um, and the work is called On the Secrets of Nature, um, and uh, it purports to be Apollonius's discovery um, of a work by Hermes in a tomb of Hermes, uh, Hermes being the same as the mer Mercury, Mercury, after which the planet is named. And you can see here in this little cartouche up here, Hermes, who is also called Mercurius, um, and he's also called Trimes. Trimagistos, the thrice great. Um, but it's curious that having given potted biographies, as it were, of Hermes, the origin of all this, uh, alleged origin of all this knowledge, and Apollonius, who um, translates it, who produces it for the general public, um, we have um, a schema giving um, the divisions of science. Uh, we haven't got scientia at the top there. Um, but we have other very familiar um, parts of science. We have theology, we have mathematics, we have physics, uh, we have econo economics, and we have politics. Um, and then mathematics, as I've already said, was divided into arithmetic, um, geometry, music, and astronomy. Uh, music is divided into uh, world music, human music, and instrumental music, and so on. Um, so there's a sense here that whatever we have in this book somehow belongs or is part um, of a general schema of the um, of the divisions of science, and uh, such a schema also indicates um, what other works should be added, and what other works should be translated if as was the case in many of the mathematical sciences, if they were lacking in the Latin tradition. Um, so, uh, are yes, these, please, um, yeah. so, so pseudo Apollonius and Hermes Trismegistus and Apollonius yeah. himself, they're all um, ancient Greek writers, right? I mean, this is, this is yeah. centuries before. Absolutely, what was... yes, yes. But what I'm saying... Um, if it didn't come across immediately, these are translations from Arabic. Um, but um, uh, that's why we call it pseudo-Apollonius, because we have no evidence that Apollonius, who lived in the first century, actually wrote that. Actually wrote this. Um, it's the Arabic text, which is called the Sira Khalika, it's got the same name, the secret of nature, um, was um, <clears throat> probably based on Greek texts, but we haven't found the Greek text. 
Um, so, so a lot of these are are Latin translations of Arabic writings that uh, yes, that yes. were maybe mm. translations of ancient Greek texts, yes. or could have been elaborations of some other kind on them. But the but the yeah. Latin writers were passing them on. They were passing them on. Yes, yes. Um, in Gerard of Cremona's time and. Gerard of Cremona translating only from Arabic, Hugo Sanctaliens is translating only from Arabic, but they are uh, they obviously knew some Greek or they knew some Greek literature um, uh, in Arabic. In fact, Apollonius is called Balinus, um, which is a bit of a corruption of the name, but somehow Hugo realized that Balinus was Apollonius. Um, he'd heard of Apollonius through hmm. reading poems. Um, and of course, Hermes, uh, who's called Hermes in Arabic, called, but he's called Trismegistos, which is the Greek name of the ancient sage, um, as well as Mercurius. And we can see here, Idio at Hermes Graecae. Uh, well, it's, this is interesting because in Greek he's called Hermes, but in Latin he's called Interpres. He's called the interpreter because... Uh, which um, which is sermo, which is speech, um, or interpretatio, um, her, her, hermeneutica, we call it hermenia anyway, because he passes knowledge from God to men. He is the intermediary. Um, so we're dealing very much with the discovery of ancient knowledge, or purportedly ancient knowledge, um, and um, and a knowledge which encompasses um, the whole of human knowledge, um, the uh, um, uh, the giving a man the ability, or a woman, um, the ability to reach the higher stage uh, which a human being can reach um, and and come close to God. So that's uh, right. I mean, when I'm I'm really interested in this idea <laughs> that the that the Latin writers at this time. Um, we're very interested in sort of digging up, you know, ancient secrets, right, of the ancient really digging world. Up and... Because Apollonius, at the beginning, he sees a statue of um, of Hermes, and there's a note on the statue, and it says, dig underneath me, and you will find <laughs> something very important. Wow. <laughs> Literally it. digging up. <laughs> he finds the dead body of Hermes, and Hermes had got this book, well, he's got two things. He's got this book, and he's also got another work, uh, well, a tablet called the uh, Emerald Tablet, which um, has a much shorter text, which is at the end of this text, in fact, but gives, um, as it is the, uh, as it were, the doctrine, um, the the summary of the doctrine taken up by alchemists, um, all in Arabic, all, all originally in Arabic. Um, but I'm just... Um, uh, having said that um, Spain is one of the centers, then if you go a little bit further east, you have Sicily as another center for the transmission of Arabic learning. But here it's mixed up with Greek because Sicily was very much a place where Greek was spoken, um, an ancient well part of the Byzantine Empire, uh, Empire before it was conquered by the Arabs in the uh, seventh century. Um, no, sorry, in the eighth century. And um, and we can still see this is the um, um, this is the cathedral of of um, Syracuse, Syracuse, a very much a Greek city within Sicily, which is built round a, a temple dedicated to Athena. You can still see the ancient the columns of the ancient temple, um, and so here we have translations going in all directions, from Arabic to Greek, from Greek into Arabic, from Arabic into Latin, from Greek into Latin. Um, and we know um, that it was a tri not only a triangular island, Sicily, but also a trilingual um, island. Um, um, well, one, one indication is this very well-known Capella Palatina, built in the middle of the 12th century by Roger II, the Norman king. The Normans conquered um, um, Sicily from the Arabs in the late 11th century, at about the same time as Alfonso I and VI conquered um, Toledo from the um, Muslims. Um, and his cap, cap his chapter, his his chapel in Palermo indic it gives indications of the three different um, ethnic groups. Um, the uh, mosaics obviously are um, Greek, Byzantine um, in style, probably built, um, made by Byzantine um, 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 uh, um, 
by Byzantine workmen. Um, the uh, you can see the the basilica shape itself is Latin, and then the roof, which you can't see here, um, is decorated um, entirely with these um, uh, with a kind of stalagmite. De um, um, stalactite, stalagmite um, decoration, which was put up there by Arabic craftsmen. We'll see an example a bit later. But just to show you that this is a, a lang an island uh, of the three languages, this is also um, probably commissioned by Roger II, who died in 1154. It's a Psalter. Um, you have, um, of course, uh, the Arabic in the, on the right because you read Arabic from right to left. So it's um, 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 clear that we have to start with the Arabic on the right. Uh, we have the Greek on the left and we have the Latin in the middle. And we can identify where these translations come from. But the very fact that they're three together indicates that there were worshippers um, uh, speaking all three languages um, associated especially with the Cathedral of Palermo. Um, I could say, but I haven't actually got a slide to show, um, that the third centre for translation um, was the newly conquered Holy Land. Um, the Crusaders arrived in 1099 and uh, they got established very quickly. Um, uh, and um, um, a, a particularly important place for um, communication between Greeks and Arabs and um, Latins or Norman speakers or Roman speakers was Antioch, one of the four patriarchal capitals of the church. Um, and, um, and we have translations again from Greek and from Latin and from Arabic into Latin there. Um, so there are these three places which became um, um, centers for translations at almost the same time because of the reconquest, because of the crusader, um, the crusade, the first crusade, and so on. Um, so having given the context, as it were, I shall now go on to highlight some of the most important trans, um, things um, that were items which were transmitted from Arabic into Latin um, according to the order of the quadrivium. So we start with arithmetic. Um, if, you, if you don't mind me asking, yes. uh, because I'm having a bit of trouble uh, putting the, the time frame uh, together. Yes. Uh, so when translating from Greek, were there a lot of primarily Greek speakers at the time, or was it mostly translating from Greek text? Hey, that's, a, that's a very good point. Um, and, and, and you can say the same about the Arabic. I, um, I, well, I'm convinced that there was, in fact, more contact um, between um, Christian um, Latin-speaking scholars and Arabs, who were they called, I mean, in some cases they called their masters, than between um, the Greeks and the Latins. Um, uh, what happened in the Greek Latin, it was about the same time. In the early 12th century, we have embassies um, from Pisa, um, for example, to um, Byzantium, and manuscripts are brought back um, into that in, into Italy, uh, mainly in Italy, where translations were made from Greek into Latin in the 12th century. It was only when Byzantium fell to the Muslims in 1453 that there was a, a significant exodus of Greek scholars um, to the West, especially to Italy again. And they became teachers, they became scribes of Greek manuscripts, copiers, and so on. And you have contacts. Um, in this period, in the 12th century, there was very little contact between Greeks and, and Latins. Um, the, con the transmission of knowledge was through manuscripts rather than through people. It is said um, that um, you know, the La Latins went through a period of well, a, a dark age, um, whilst the Greek, this Greek knowledge, um, which was complemented by knowledge from India, from China, and especially from Persia, um, really survived and flourished in the Arabic world. Um, it's a little bit unfair to call the um, Latin world in the well, pre-12th century uh, um, um, obscured in a dark age, because there were some sciences in which they did excel. And here we have, well, we have both sides of the story, really, because here we have 
um, uh, uh, manuscripts giving um, great details for to how to calculate using the traditional Roman numerals and especially the divisions of the Roman numerals, which were called the asses, the aspiral asses. Um, and these were used, this calculation was done especially to establish the uh, dates of the Christian festivals because they were always changing, Easter, Whitsuntide and that sort of thing. Um, so in the top part of this, we have... Okay. Well, in fact, we have multiplication tables, how to multiply, you know, six, six twelfths by um, nine twelfths or uh, how to multiply um, um, three and um, three whole integers and um, and five twelfths by four whole integer, integers and seven twelfths. Um, so it's a multi multiplication table. Um, but then underneath it, um, we have the first inkling of the use of or the knowledge of Arabic, what we call Arabic numerals. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, if you look more closely, you might recognize uh, in this table with columns, um, on the very right-hand side, you have an A and you have a 1. Um, the A is um, the Greek A, in fact, the capital al um, uh, Alpha. And the one is um, well from the Arabs, um, and then the next one is B, and then a two. You can recognize it as a two, but it's upside down. And then uh, mm. then you have a gamma, um, sorry, uh, yes, a gamma, which is then a three. And you can see the three has three, you know, th um, is made out of three um, lines, as it were, but. but 90 degrees to our normal three. The four is more complicated, but it's in, uh, um, it's equivalent to delta. And then the five is also a little bit stranger, um, different from our pre present five, and is it, uh, equivalent to epsilon. But here we have... And so we're going kind of from, from right to left down yeah, at the well, bottom. We're going from right to left because we're in... We're in Arabic, um, well, the Arabic thinking, as it were, um, and uh, and what we have is an abacus table, which tells you how to make calculations, not using the multiplication table, which is immediately above it, um, but by using dies or um, 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 little um, what would what would you call it? Um, um, uh, well, um, you what what you would also use um, um, in other games, little dies with with the numbers actually marked on them. So if you wanted to um, calculate um, three times four, you would take a die which has a three on it and put it in the co column of the uh, digits, and and then you would take a die which has a four on it and put it also in the column of the digits. It's a very simple calculation. And then you would uh, multiply the two together, and then you'd have a twelve. And so the one would go in the column, the a die with the one written on it, um, would go in the column of the digits, and the two would go into the column of the tens. And you can see that the the uh, digits and tens and hundreds and thousands, and then um, ten thousand, uh, hundred thousand, and so on, are marked in Roman numerals um, just underneath these Arabic numerals that I've already been mentioning. So what what date is this again? Is oh, well, this, this is early 12th century. It's a manuscript from Oxford, um, and it's just at the time when Arabic numerals started to become known. In fact, they were known, but only on the abacus, and only as markers uh, on the Ar uh, abacus die, the, um, the settle of the Arab uh, 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 um, of the ab abacus, and you can see, um, well, this is another abacus table which hasn't really been filled in. Um, you can see the Roman numerals 1, 10, uh, 100, etc., and just underneath you can see the Arabic numerals 1, 2, the upside down 2. Um, uh, yeah, I can use my first uh, actually 1, 2, and then the 3, which has three little prongs, then the 4, then the 5, then the 6. You can recognize more the, the 7, which has just been turned around a little bit, and the 8, which consists of two circles, the 9 is obvious, and then the 0 at the end. Uh, and they all have their own names, which is curious. Um, some people suggest that oh, some are obviously Arabic names, but some others seem to be Berber names. And then um, you have this little quotation, Gerbertus, 
um, Latio uh, Numeros Abaki et Figuras, and we have to have something like Dedit at the end. So Gerbus gave the numbers and the figures of the Abacus to Latium, um, to the Latin people, and this is Gerbert Dorilac, who lived at the end of the 10th century, where we have a brief flowering, as it were, of mathematics. This is where we have the first in, uh, indication of um, the astrolabe brought in from the Arabs, text in Latin on the astrolabe, and uh, an actual astrolabe, which I'll show you in a moment, um, uh, made in the 10th century. And then there was a, a hiatus, as it were. There was no further development. These numbers were associated only with the abacus until the early 12th century, um, and I'll just give you some indications that what we have are these Arabic numerals. The Arabs um, took these numerals from the Indians. Um, they were, in fact, Sanskrit symbols, and they were the first symbols um, to actually have um, place value. I mean, if you need to, uh, need explanation of that, I mean, it means that you can use the same symbol, but say a two, um, in uh, as a unit, as a ten, a hundred, a thousand, so you can make um, two or twenty or two hundred or two thousand just by moving the place of this single symbol. Um, and on an abacus, of course, you can just um, leave empty columns um, as you move the two further towards the left. And when you're writing these numbers on paper, you need another symbol to indicate that uh, there are empty places, and this is the symbol for zero, of course. And that's, of course, what the what Latin numerals didn't have, and, what and they why this was have. so useful. Um, Other than just being more concise, they could... It's, it's very useful. It's very much easier to make calculations when you only have a single symbol for a single numeral. I mean, to have XXX for 30, to have LX for 40, and so on. Um, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, for, for 60. Um, these are very cumbersome. And, um, um, and uh, what is emphasized is that you can make any number up to infinity um, or beyond infinity, if you like, uh, just by using nine symbols plus the zero. The nine symbols were regarded as being well, as having significance, the zero e equals nothing, you know. And that was a rather different concept, difficult concept to under to grasp. How can something mean no nothing? Um, but it was the place marker um, when there wasn't one of the nine numerals. Um, and we have this uh, Arabic work, um, contemporary with the Latin uh, discovery, as it were, or use, of the Hindu, we call them Hindu Arabic numerals from now on because they came from India, and they were only only very slightly changed in their appearance um, in the Arabic world, and they were known in Arabic as Indian numerals. And when they were introduced into Latin, they were also called uh, Indian numerals, as we shall see. But um, here's a book in the 12th century on demonstration and recollection of the art of dustborne reckoning, because you were. Uh, you, used, uh, you used a board which is lightly covered with dust, and you did your calculations by making using a stylus to make these numerals within the dust, and you could very easily uh, erase the numbers in the process of uh, calculation. And like so a this... chalkboard. Oh, yes. Yeah, I was going to say, that's just like a, like a blackboard. <laughs> like a blackboard. But contemporary to this, of course, um, people in Europe are using the wax tablets, but, I mean, what happens to a wax tablet in North Africa or in Saudi Arabia? Mm -hmm. It melts. So so instead of the wax tablet, they had a dust board. Um, or they had simply a, a, a wooden board <laughs> which scratched the numbers on or the letters or the, uh, or, or the uh, figures. But you can see here already there are two kinds of Hindu-Arabic numerals. This is more familiar to, to us. One, two, three, always from the right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And this is regarded as being the Eastern forms of the Arabic numerals, um, which in fact developed into the Arabic numerals used in contemporary, well, which continue to be used in the Arabic world and still very close to the um, printed Arabic numerals you will find in all Arabic texts. Um, and you have another, the same author, uh, another series, so uh, the two series here, and uh, in uh, well, 
um, to, to, to emphasize this. This is the 12th century, well, early, sorry, early 13th century or, or late 12th century um, uh, author from North Africa. And he too has these two sets, uh, he says here, uh, that uh, we, we, these are called the gubar um, forms, and gubar means dust, so this emphasizes the fact that you are drawing them in dust. Um, and these are the Western forms, which are for more familiar to us. And then there's also another form, and these are the Eastern forms. Um, and there's some that's rather different. The eight, for example, is simply the reverse of the seven in the Eastern forms. Um, and the um, um, uh, the the six is very different, and the six looks very much like the six that we use. Uh, the nine here is third and straight. So there are a few little differences. And then when when we go into the Western, uh, we'll, we'll look at Latin manuscripts. Um, here again, you have the two two sets. Um, the, this set, the Eastern forms, you can recognize them by now, are called the Indian figures, figures, indique figure. And this, these are the Western forms, which you know, developed into those that we use nowadays in the West, um, which don't have a name. But these are well, very similar, and they're specifically called the Toledan forms. So we can infer that these were introduced via um, the translations or the translators or the scholars um, who were working in Toledo in the mid-12th century. Um, and uh, as you can see, the zero is regarded not as being one of these numerals, uh, but it has a place of its own. You can represent the zero by a, a circle or by a T, which probably comes from the Greek, uh, ancient Greek use of T for theta, um, and or for the Latin terminus, meaning just the end. Um, and they are described, well, I suppose all of these, no, no, no just, sorry, just the, um, just the zeros are, just, are the cifre and cifra, is the Arabic word for a zero, um, but it gives rise to all these European words, uh, cipher, sheaf, um, zero, in fact. These all, all these words come from the Arabic word, sifra, um, and because perhaps this was the most interesting, the most un unique um, form of numeral, um, the word for zero became universalized to indicate all these uh, Hindu-Arabic numerals. Um, and just to give one example of the use of these numerals, this is our favorite Hugo Sanctaliensis from Tarazona, translating not only pseudo Apollonius, but also works on astronomy and astrology, um, but using the Eastern forms of the numerals. So he must have been in contact with uh, Arabic scholars who were more familiar with this Eastern version, which we find um, in North and North. East Spain in the Valley of the Ebro um, and in Pisa, for example, and in Italy more general, but not in Toledo. Um, and so this is one three, um, one three seven. This is sixty. This is ten. This is forty, and so on. So um, uh, then we have uh, a text um, written by the great Arabic as uh, uh, astronomer mathematician Al Khwarizmi in the early ninth century. He introduced um, um, Indian ways of calculating the positions of the planets, uh, so astronomical tables. He introduced um, Indian ways of the Indian way of calculating using the Hindu Arabic numerals. Um, he also introduced algebra into Arabic or invented, as it were. Um, no, let's say just introduced. Um, and then one of the earliest Latin works, which tell us not only the numerals, <coughs> which were already on the abacus text, um, but also how to calculate with them, is by al Khwarizmi. And because al Khwarizmi um, was regarded as the, the inventor almost of this, um, this kind of text was called the Algorismus, um, the word coming from al Khwarizmi. And this, uh, it begins actually, Dixit al um, as al Quarismus said, and you can see the Western forms of the numerals there. And I think I've got just one more from, from the same manuscript in the Hispanic Society of America in New York, uh, where you can see if you, if you want, I mean, um, uh, here are the figures of the, of the tens, 
um, and you have a zero after the one for the ticket figures of the tens. And here the figure, sorry, that is a figure for 10 itself. And this is a figure for 20. You have a two and a zero and this for 30, three and a zero. And then he goes on to the next um, de the decimal place. And here's the figure for 100 and the figure for 200 and so on. Well, any, any questions about arithmetic then? I just well, sorry, I've just got a couple of more slides. This is a later Arabic manuscript of algebra. Uh, I've already shown you this jither, this root, this sign for the root. Um, but on this side, we have a more complicated thing. Um, algebra, uh, as you will know, involves um, an unknown quality, which is represented by an X, um, and a square or several squares, several squares of that property. And in Arabic, the square is called the mal, which means um, the riches or the property. Um, and so um, this is abbreviated to a, a meme, the Arabic letter for M. Um, and the unknown property um, is... Um, described as the shy, the thing in Arabic. So we have the first letter of shy, which is a sheen, a sh sound, um, which was represented in uh, in Latin, this sh sound, by an X. And that's the origin of our use of X for the unknown. So here we have five, uh, five square, and then we have um, four X, and then we have others here. But uh, um, but just to remind you that this algebra, not this very text, but uh, uh, again, a, a form of algebra written by Al-Khwarizmi was translated into Latin in the mid-12th century. We have um, both, uh, well, tr transmission via um, the value of the Ebro and also um, at Toledo by Gerard of Cremona. Um, and so they use the X as the shy, the thing, the unknown quantity. I mean, we still um, use uh, Arabic numerals and call them Arabic numerals, so they really are uh, Hindu I Arabic. Was, we talked, like, for the briefest amount of time about Fibonacci and how he had yes. kind of adapted these. But this is where it's coming from, right? I mean, ultimately. It, this is uh, 100 years before Fibonacci, of course. Yes, yes. And Fibonacci almost reinvented the Arabic, Hindu Arabic numerals, Um uh, he says he picked them up in North Africa in Bijaya and uh, mm -hmm. um, Al Bijaya, um, but in fact they had been around. He was probably, uh, but but certainly his works, his arithmetical works, um, are far in advance of any of the works that preceded him. So, but are based entirely on on Arabic um, texts, especially someone called Abu Kamil. So, with geometry, um, the uh, the great author of works on geometry was, of course, Euclid um, and his elements. Um, and this was this, strangely enough, um, just became lost in the West. Just a few of the first four books survived um, in the West in a Latin translation. Greek, of course, was forgotten, so no one was reading um, at least the complete elements in the West. But the Arabs um, typically um, translated the whole of the elements, uh, well, twice or even three times. Um, and this became the basis of their own um, a geometrical tradition. We have here a book which is called the uh, summary um, of the chapters, or the books rather, of the book of Euclid. You can recognize Euclides as Euclid. Um, and so this is um, not exactly Euclid's elements, but a work derived and very much based on Euclid's elements. And you can see, well, perhaps you can work out exactly what the theorems um, are, uh, what theorems are being um, demonstrated here. Um, we have the, uh, the other form of writing numbers in Arabic, which is using the Arabic letters. It's an alphanumerical system. So here you have a kaf, and aha, which means 25, and here we have in red a 26. Um, so, um, sorry, 25, and yet. But then, and this uh, Euclid's Elements was translated into Latin, and one might say, uh, one 
translate um, that it is through the Arabic version of the Greek elements that the Latins um, uh, picked up their geometry again in the 12th century uh, in the several translations, one by Gerard of Cremona, of course, in Toledo, but in, uh, a couple in the Valley of the Ebro, Herman of Corinthia, and uh, but the um, the um, pioneer in translating the elements from Arabic was someone was an Englishman called Adelard of Bath, um, who who went to the Crusader states. And in fact, uh, um, he we know that he was in Antioch in the very early 12th century. And that's where maybe where he picked up his knowledge and certainly his manuscripts, his Arabic manuscripts of the works that he translated, of which the first in, um, you could say, in a curriculum um, of mathematics was the elements. He translated the elements and then he went on to translate works on uh, astronomy and then astrology and finally magic. But here's a wonderful manuscript from the British Library, um, which includes all, uh, well, texts on all the seven liberal arts, um, plus works of Aristotle. Um, and it picks up here um, Adelard of Bath's, um, one of his translations of the elements, because he translated, first of all, very literally, and then he re, uh, well, he adapted his translation um, for, for teaching um, and making it more coherent and showing especially the connection between one theorem and another. And if we look at um, the uh, um, capital, excuse me, the the capital letter which um, precedes the elements, we have a lady geometry herself teaching um, uh, a lot of students, including, I think, a master who's pointing. But she's pointing, and she's got a gnomon, and she's got some compasses, she's got uh, various geometrical shapes on the table in front of her, and she's got a very attentive audience. Um, so this is just, again, emphasizing the importance of geometry. Um, now, um, I'm jumping straight to music, um, um, because um, um, one might think that um, the Arabic influence on Western music was not so um, uh, decisive as that on arithmetic and geometry and finally astronomy, um, um, because there was a lively tradition, whether you think of the Gregorian chant, whether you think of the um, uh, of native Arab uh, Latin music treatises, including one on Boethius, by Boethius, um, but also uh, by the 11th century, we, we have Guido d'Arezzo establishing the theory of music and the practice of how to write music and so on. Um, but, but there is some Arabic influence, and part of this... Um, uh, uh, is based on the idea um, that um, everything is related within the world, um, that the um, that the musical tones, um, or, or in this case, in fact, the musical modes, or um, what they call maqam, maqamat in uh, Arabic, um, the different ways of playing, the different scales, you might say, um, are related to the different signs of the zodiac, are related to the different elements, are related to the different qualities, the different humors, different sexes, and the different times of the day, of the days of the week. Um, and this is so fundamental to the idea of music in the Arabic world in this, in, in this period, um, that... Um, you can use music um, to cure diseases, um, what you might call music therapy. And because if someone is suffering from um, an excess of um, um, phlegm, cold and humid, then you have to just make sure that you're playing a mood, a mode, um, which is hot and dry. Um, and if and you've got to make sure you're playing it at the right time of day and on the right day to have its maximum effect. Um, and we see, um, well, I'll just give a little bit more examples of the, the power of music within the Arabic world. Um, so that, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, the chart that you were just showing us was yeah. like kind of a physician's manual for... It's a <laughs> for physician's like... manual, yes, yes. <laughs> It would have been known to the general public too. I mean, uh, um, if if it's if it's Monday, and if you want to, you know, have a 
um, uh, uh, the appropriate music for Monday evening. Here it is. It's it's a mood, <laughs> mood from Isfahan. Uh, strangely enough, I think that's the only mode named after a place. And there's an Iraq just up there too. But uh, is this uh, re related to the idea of um, in Indian music? You have ragas at different parts the of the day. Are not this uh, are not dissimilar. No. Um, and you have probably the same number of ragas as you have here, with 12 uh, modes, uh, which are more than the different modes you have in the Gregorian chant, for example. Um, but also you can observe um, whether cancer is rising or in a, um, in a, uh, uh, um, in a conspicuous position in the sky, um, if, uh, as well as making sure it's Monday and so on, um, just for your own entertainment. It, uh, um, the music is enhanced um, and the effect is much stronger um, if it brings together that of the effect of the planet, that the, of the, uh, the climate of the, um, the time of day of the, um, you know, the warmth. Um, um, everything is connected. Everything is connected. So it's not just for you know, for the ill, but also for the well, to preserve them in good health. Um, and, uh, but uh, just showing a rather amusing picture of a work composed actually in Persian in the 12th century called the Khamis of Nizami. This is a 12th century copy of this work, but it's Plato, that's Plato, playing the organ. And, uh, there's some Western influence in this particular um, illustration. Um, you can see a sort of Western man painted on the organ uh, case here. Um, but organ has a, a double meaning, of course. It does mean also the works of logic by Aristotle form the organum, which is the same word. Um, but here he's playing the organ, and the effect of his playing of the organ is that all these wild animals go to sleep. So he must be playing a very calming kind of music, which has an effect on what we call the spirits of these wild animals. The spirits are directly affected, and they all go to sleep. Um, and... Um, um, but you can manifest uh, in the Arabic world this um, these correspondences um, are um, most easy um, to manifest on what is regarded as being the Arabic instrument par excellence. I mean, um, if the sitar is the Indian in a musical instrument by excellence, the, the lute is the Arabic one. And you can see um, the Arabic word for uh, this instrument is al-oud, um, which gave rise to the uh, Western, um, well, the Western forms of the names for this instrument, including our own lute. Um, and you can see it, um, the description, um, the top is called the safa, um, Sifa al Aoud, the description of the uh, lute, and this is the neck, the onk, and then you have um, five strings uh, which each have their own names, and you have the roses here and so on. Um, but um, uh, we have descriptions of how each of these strings um, 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 corresponds to a, an element. You have the four um, earthly elements of fire, water, air, and, um, and earth. Um, but you have a fifth um, string corresponding to the ether, the celestial element. Um, the shape of the lute itself um, is like half a hemisphere, um, so it represents half the, you know, the, the celestial sphere. Um, the frets are related to the planets, there are four of them there, um, and so on. You know, at every stage you are reminded of these um, correspondences, one would call them. Um, and um, the lute was introduced into um, Europe, you could say, as, at the same, same time as many uh, other Arabic instruments, some of which still recall um, their Arabic names. The rabab, which is the um, bowed instrument, uh, a bit like uh, um, a bit like a violin, um, became um, what was called the rebek. And if we go to the next stage, we can actually see um, the difference between the lute, which is on this side here, a plucked instrument, always with a bent neck here, um, and the, the rabab, which is always a bowed instrument. And here you can see 
well, it's got a different kind of neck. Um, and these are two musicians entertaining somebody who's drinking in the middle here. Um, and these are some three of the um, uh, of the illustrations of paradise, one might say, which are in the ceiling of the Capella Palatina, which I showed you earlier on. Um, but we couldn't actually see these coffets in the what called coffets in the ceiling. Um, now, one might say, uh, um, well, there, there are hints that this idea, the idea of correspondences, um, was brought into uh, Europe from the Arabs, um, and uh, and you see uh, examples, for example, in in, in medical works. Um, there's a work which was translated from Arabic. Uh, in uh, the late 11th century by Constantine the African called the Viaticum, um, which uh, means in the Greek and the Arabic, the Arabic was translated both into Greek and Latin, um, the medical work that you take around with you wherever you go. Uh, so it's a work for self-help. Um, and, uh, and there's a whole section about how to cure psychological diseases, um, I mean, you might be wandering somewhere in the desert and you uh, overcome, you're overwhelmed by grief um, or by love sickness. And you can read in the Viaticum how you can use musical instruments and particular modes and so on to cure that mental disease, psychological disease. Um, so there are uh, um, some of this music therapy, as you might call, might call it, um, pass over to the Latins. Um, and certainly doesn't have, although the Latins were always aware of the power of music, the specific connections between um, different um, scales, um, different elements, different times of day and that sort of thing is something which we, which we find at least um, catalogued, um, uh, um, described in a structured way in that in Arabic before it is in Latin. So, um, so that's music. Any... any uh, any questions about music? But uh, we might as well just uh, plunge into astronomy. Astronomy maybe is, a, well, I don't know, um, it's certainly, there are certainly more texts on astronomy um, uh, that were translated from Arabic into Latin than for any of the other arts of the quadrivium. Um, and I'll just give you um, a selection of what we have. We have astronomical um, we have star tables. Here we have um, a list of all the um, the stars, the names of the stars in the constellation of um, Ba'ates, in fact, is Awa in Arabic. Um, and there are several stars in this particular constellation, and we have their latitude and longitude. On the other side, we have the stars of a constellation called Aklil, which is the, uh, uh, or uh, Shamali, which is the northern crown. Um, but you also have, I mean, this was actually on the advertisement for this lecture, um, uh, the constellations, the stars and the constellations um, uh, actually put on um, images of the names of the constellation. This is a sign of the zodiac of, of Taurus, as you can see, and we have all the uh, stars marked in their right positions. Um, uh, um, this is uh, the, the famous um, um, star, star well, map uh, images of a Sufi, um, whereby each of the constellations is shown twice, once, as you will see it when it's marked on a celestial sphere, i.e. on the outside, as it were, and the other as it's seen from the surface of the earth by man. Um, um, and then, uh, well, here is a magical text, one might say, in which um, the circles, I mean circles, if you're thinking of astronomy, if you're thinking of magic, um, it's very natural to think of circles. These are circles of the signs of the zodiac, um, which are around the, well, sort of in the middle here, actually, um, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, and so on, um, uh, associated with the different um, elements again which are in this circle the different compass directions which are in this circle and this circle uh, actually uh, also has the signs of the zodiac but has the numbers uh and destroy the names associated with it and then if we come to the latin world um already in the late 10th century we have um alongside works on the astrolabe um works on um um astronomy um um and astrology indeed 
Um, and here we have a list of all the climbs, the seven climbs from the equator being the first climb. Um, and uh, the Arabic words transliterated into Latin over the Latin translations here word for word, which indicates that people were still interested in the original Arabic um, and to confirm the Latin translation, as it were, they include the Latin Arabic words. Um, and, and of course, the translation becomes very literal. And here's the famous Carolingian astrolabe, also brought into well, Catalonia, Barcelona, maybe, um, in the late 10th century, made by an Arabic um, uh, craftsman, um, but inscribed with these Latin letters. So it's a mixture. Um, it marks the very point, as it were, whereby an Arabic artifact ed, um, uh, passes into the hands of a Latin speaker. And here we have the Latin translation by Adelard of both of these astronomical tables, which are, well, of astronomical tables, showing you the positions of the planets at any one time. Um, and uh, they show very clearly in the in the rubric that this is from Arabic. It says the hair begins a siege, which is described as the opus or the work of Al Khwarizmi, a famous Al Khwarizmi, the introducer of Hindu Arabic numerals, um, per um, per Adalad and Bathanian, some ex Arabic co sum to so. Uh, he's very proud that he's taken this from the Arabs, and we even have Arabic words, the Al Hijra, for the epoch, and Al Bukharam as the first month of the Arabic year. And strangely enough, the letters, the numbers are also in Arabic. And, uh, and the, but the culmination of this translation of astronomy is the uh, Ptolemy's Almagest, written in the second century AD, translated not into Latin, but into Arabic and translated twice. And this um, manuscript has the two translations together. In fact, we have the earlier translation by someone called Hajjaj in the middle here, and we have the later translation by Ishaq Ibn Hunayn in the margin. And you have a similar thing when it's translated into Latin. Then you have the original translation of Hajjaj, and then in Alio in another translation. So this is the Latin uh, of another translation of the same text, and a lot of commentary. Um, and this, uh, from the same Melbourne manuscript, you have more examples of this very, um, but showing just how interested people were in this great text by um, Ptolemy. And I think, well, Al-Fagani is another um, a simplified version of as uh, um, autonomy, and this is just to bring us into the Middle Ages, into the Renaissance. Here we have a translation uh, of Alpha, an edition, but a Latin translation made in the middle of the seventh century. Uh, there it is again. And finally, we have, well, we still have the interest in astronomical tables based on observation of the stars, and this is the tables of Ulug Beg made in, uh, uh, drawn up uh, in the uh, the observatory of Samarkand at the beginning of the 15th century and translated in Oxford by um, by Thomas Hyde in um, um, uh, 1665. So I shall just leave it there with this idea that um, astronomy above all remained of interest um, to the Westerners because of the developments made in, in the Arabic world. And people could even say, or do even say, I'll just uh, um, end with this controversial uh, statement that there are certain um, paradigms, um, astronomical paradigms, in the um, um, devised by Arabs in the late 16th century, sorry, the late 15th uh, um, the late, uh, yes, the late 15th century, which were taken up by Copernicus in the early 16th century and inspired him to invent the heliocentric system. So I shall just stop there. Thank you so much. This is amazing. So the, so the connection at the end is, uh, maybe to, to, Copernicus, but but all of the material that you've been showing us was sort of floating around also in Europe at this time. So it's it would be hard to pin down what exactly people were looking at at any one time, would it be? Yeah, well, yes, yes. Um, I mean, people who are against the supposition 
uh, that Copernicus drew from Arabic sources saying, well, um, you know, astronomy was so firmly established in Europe, um, partly because of these translations made in the 12th century, um, that European, well, these fine European astronomers were able to develop, you know, new theorems, new paradigms for the, for the planets um, within their own tradition rather than by taking more uh, information from elsewhere. But as you've shown, the whole tradition was really informed by the Arabic yes. science. So there's no, I mean, there can't be any question about that part. It's just whether or not Copernicus was literally looking at, you know, a particular. Yes, yes, yes. yes. But Copernicus was a very honest scholar and he, he tells us where he gets his information from. And, and there is, in fact, an absence of any Arabic. Well, he knows the earlier ones. He knows Al-Batan, he knows Abu Masha. But, um, but he doesn't refer to his Arabic contemporaries. Well, thank you so much for this. Does anybody have uh, questions or comments? Or... Um, this is intriguing. Um, and so just, a, a, I'm not at all an expert, so my question would be, do you have recommendations for further reading or for prior reading, perhaps I should say? <laughs> well, um, yes. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a book um, by someone called Dag Hasse, uh, which is entirely about, um, well, the continuing um, use uh, of Arabic material in the Renaissance. It's called, mm -hmm. um, it's called Success and Suppression, Arabic Studies in the Renaissance. Um, and he calls it that because, um, well, the Arabs still had success in the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, um, but there was also a lot of criticism saying, you know, why not? Why do, why do we tend to depend on Arabic works when we can go right back to the Greek sources for Ptolemy and uh, Euclid and so on? Um, so that's a very interesting and very full uh, account, mm -hmm. um, but concentrating on the uh, Renaissance, um, and then you have, but well, uh, we still have a very valuable book by Charles Homer Haskins, already written in the, um, I think first published in nineteen twenty seven or nineteen twenty four, revised nineteen twenty seven, on uh, uh, studies in the history of um, of medieval science, um, and he shows just um, how important Arabic sources were. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Charles Homer Haskins and uh, I'm Charles just putting Homer it. Haskins, yes. Um, I don't have any questions, but thank you so much for for giving this lecture. It was very informative. I must leave, but th again, thank you so much for opening up this uh, this world. Yes, right. -o. So I shall and uh, say goodbye and um, goodbye. Thanks. Yeah. And, thank uh, you. Thanks yeah. very much.